certainly one of the most unique aircraft ever built, is the Hughes H-4, also known as the HK-4, the Hercules, and most popularly, the Spruce Goose. This aircraft was built by Hughes Aviation during World War II to ferry troops and equipment across the Atlantic to Europe at a time when many ships were being sunk carrying supplies, but yet critical materials such as aluminum were in short supply due to the war effort. Hughes worked out a plan to build a huge aircraft out of almost entirely wood to save on those critical materials and still get the job done. The Spruce Goose is housed at the Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum in McMinnville, Oregon, which is southwest of the city of Portland. The original hangar at the museum was built to house the Spruce Goose, although other airplanes have been added, traded, come and gone during that time. The Spruce Goose remains the center of the museum. There are additional buildings which have been added since that time to house a space museum, a theater, and other objects. The point of this video is to show some short snippets that I took of the inside of the aircraft, but before that, here is an overview, sort of a panorama video, of the overall airplane taking from the best perspectives. The plane is so large that the wings still clear high above the high mezzanine level of the museum. and the Spruce Goose remains the largest aircraft ever built in terms of wingspan. It well exceeds even the largest contemporary cargo aircraft. In addition to being a famous airplane in its own right, the Goose is also a historic mechanical engineering landmark. It was constructed in the years 1943 through 1946 and was flown only after the end of the World War II. There are several levels of tour you can get of the inside of the Spruce Goose. One is the general view which does not cost anything extra and this can be seen from a plexiglass enclosure just inside a door on the side of the fuselage. These videos show the limits of what you can see. It's a small room with the plexiglass walls. You can look forward into the uh, center level of the nose section as well as down the tail of the fuselage. Here is the ladder that goes up to the cockpit level some of the cable trays for controls and hydraulics, engineering stations, but you don't really get to see much more at this level. You can also pay for a cockpit photo and also a VIP tour which give you various levels of access to the inside of the plane. My videos were taken during the VIP tour which also includes the cockpit video or cockpit access. These red tanks are part of the fire suppression system which was added only after the original flight. Here are some of the control cables and hydraulic lines and here is where the two wings butt together in the middle of the fuselage. Here again are the fire suppression tanks and in the back are some beach balls, quite a few of them actually, which were used for emergency flotation in the wing pontoons if any of them were ruptured on landing. Uh, without the pontoons floating properly, the plane could not take off again. The museum no longer allows visitors to go up into the 
main part of the fuselage behind the wing as shown here. Even though there is a catwalk, it's considered too unsafe and too hard on the airplane to have many visitors traipsing around back there. Also, if anybody had any difficulties like an injury, it would be very difficult for the paramedics and other uh, support people to get back in there without damaging the aircraft. The fire suppression system is important on an all-wood airplane, but during the original and only flight, these tanks were not yet installed and engineers carried handheld fire extinguishers. Here is a hull vent line for the bilge. In the middle level of the nose section are engineer stations for the hydraulic engineer and the electrical engineer. This is the electrical engineering panel and behind it is the hydraulic engineers panel. In the ceiling of this area are mounted a couple of antennas for the automatic direction finder or ADF. On most aircraft these would be mounted outside of the fuselage. This is the APU, which consists of a pair of Franklin aircraft engines. These generated the power used to start the Spruce Goose's own engines. This is the forward edge of the wings, and there are many pipes. These are uh, including the fuel lines, oil lines, and so on, coming up the center and branching out into the wings. Here's the access door into the uh, right wing walkway which is tall enough for a man to stand up in. The back of the engines, the oil pumps, all of the fuel lines, oil lines, electrical lines can be accessed during flight. The green tank in the wing is a fuel surge tank used to buffer the flow from the main tanks into the uh, branch lines going to each engine. Back inside the fuselage there is a white tank which performs a similar function for engine oil and where the flashlight is illuminating is one of the oil pumps. The inside of the wing within the fuselage can be accessed through these crawl space holes which are a very tight fit. Not as accommodating as the ports into the main wings themselves. This is a port to the top of the wing used for access to the wing top as well as for guidance during docking. This is the passenger area, which has many seats as well as all of the testing stations used by engineers to monitor the first flight. Most of this test equipment would not have been here if the aircraft had ever entered operational service. The fuselage skin has been removed in this area to admit more light. Back when Walt Disney displayed the aircraft, in Long Beach, California. This was the area where visitors could enter and look around inside the cockpit area. Here's the assistant flight engineers area. More of the passenger seats and more instrumentation for tests during the initial flight.
This is part of the flight engineer station. There are levers for controlling the hydraulic systems and generators for each engine. Here's the flight engineer's backup hand pump for the hydraulic system. The docent is pointing out the airline that supplied Howard Hughes with his own private air supply. The docent is pointing out the demarcation line where the fuselage switches from wood construction to metal construction around the windows. Part of the VIP tour is the opportunity to stand on the pilot seat, stick your head up through the pilot's roof hatch, and look around at the top of the aircraft. Quite a view. Here are the controls for the pilot, including taxiing controls, engine controls, fairly basic instrumentation. Of course, the flight engineer took care of most of that. And then a much simpler area for the co-pilot. Flight engineer station again. Returning from the cockpit level to the main level, it is quite a spacious area up here. No other aircraft made has so much room. This spiral staircase did not exist at the time the plane was originally flown. It was added only later. Uh, at the time the plane was flown, the passengers and crew reached the cockpit level by using ladders up to the small doorways at that level. Here my docent opens up the doorway again to allow exiting the secure part of the plane to the area normally accessible to visitors.